welcome back to the next session. Thanks for joining us. Uh, so, you know, for the, our speaker for this session, uh, you know, we're thrilled to have Drew Fudenberg joining us from MIT to tell us about his work on uh, learning and equilibrium refinement. So I'll let Drew take it away. Thanks, Dylan. Um, as Dylan said, I'm going to talk about learning equilibrium refinements. Um, but before I get to that, I thought it would be helpful to do a little bit of uh, review to set the stage, and then I'll get to the new stuff in the second half of the talk. So just to get on the, on the same page, um, remind you that there's now quite an extensive literature on the way that Nash equilibrium in a game can arise as a long result of a learning process, at least if the game is a one-shot simultaneous move game, a game played in the normal form. Uh, you probably also know that given an extensive form game, we can associate a normal form game. And the definition of Nash equilibrium applies unchanged to games in extensive form. However, the learning foundation of equilibrium does change because if agents are playing a game repeatedly, they needn't learn the consequences of deviating from the equilibrium path. If you always play left, you never see what your opponents would do if you played right. So if the agents are purely myopic, then learning only justifies the weaker concept of self-confirming equilibrium, not Nash equilibrium, let alone refinements. And you know, I'm not here to um, disparage self-confirming equilibrium. It's been useful in many areas of economics, uh, especially experimental economics, but also macro, our own economic history. But in other applications, we'd like to use more restrictive concepts such as Nash equilibrium, or even one of the equilibrium refinements. So let's, let's talk about when we'd expect learning to lead to Nash equilibrium or refinement in an extensive form game. Let's just say, please um, feel free to interrupt any time. I only have 32 slides. So um, probably won't need the full 45 minutes. So suppose our agents are, are playing according to some fixed strategy profile, not saying what it is or why, but that they only use that profile typically. They experiment at rate one over T, by which I mean that each period T, there's a probably one over T that the agents do something other than what their strategy prescribes. They experiment with other actions, the sort of mechanistically or as a heuristic. Well, we can look at all the information sets that have positive probability under this fixed profile. So they're hit almost every period. And if people at those nodes experiment at rate one over T, then any information set that can be reached with a single deviation from the equilibrium path or the path of a strategy profile are reached infinitely often because one over T has an infinite sum. So that means that if agents played this profile over and over and experimented in this way, then the agents who move on the path of play would eventually come to have correct beliefs about what would happen if they deviated from the equilibrium path. So if they're maximizing their, their payoff given their beliefs, and they know what would happen if they deviated and they're choosing not to deviate, we have a Nash equilibrium. So that, that's the first hint into how learning might lead to equilibrium. We need some experimentation with these off path actions. In particular, we need people to experiment at rate one over T. But note, if we want equilibrium refinements, like say backwards induction, then we need to have more information further down the tree than that. And if agents experiment at rate one over T, that needn't lead to correct beliefs at nodes that take two or more deviations to reach because one over T squared has a finite sum. So as in this picture, suppose our profile is that one mostly is playing A. Well, it's probably one over T, one experiments with B. And T each period mostly plays D because she thinks that's the best action both probably one over T, she experiments with C. Well, then one will end up playing B infinitely often, so one will learn what two is doing. And two is basically almost always playing D, and one learns that. 
And suppose that given that two is playing D, one wants to play A, that's fine. So we have a Nash equilibrium. But why is two playing D? Well, two's playing D because of what she thinks player three is doing. Will two learn what player three is doing? Well, not with this particular mechanistic specification of play, because player three is only reached in any period with probably one over t squared. So that's only a finite sum. So player two will only get a finite collection, a finite number of observations of three's play. And if two started out really pretty sure that three was playing a certain way, this finite set of data might not be enough to change her mind and lead her to the correct beliefs. Okay, well, so with this one over t rule, player two won't learn three's play. Of course, one over t was sort of arbitrary. The idea was we wanted experimentation, but we think we'd also like it to vanish asymptotically so there's no long run average cost. Suppose we replace these one over t's with one over root t. Well, now the probability that player three has reached one over t. So that happens infinitely often, okay? So that sort of raises a question, how much experimentation do we think that the players will do? And what, and what actions do we think they'll experiment with? So we could make up some assumptions or axioms of how people experiment, and that's um, one approach. But my talk today is gonna to be about a body of work that takes a different approach, where instead of making assumptions about the way that players experiment, we're gonna derive experimentation from discounted dynamic programming. And we'll find that when patients are patient, they do in fact experiment enough to rule out non-Nash equilibria. And moreover, by considering which experiments are used more often, we can derive equilibrium refinements, restrictions on which Nash equilibria arise, okay? So it'll be kind of like the classic equilibrium refinements literature, but as we'll see, it's not the same. It's not the same restrictions as those that have been developed in the classic literature, which is maybe not that surprising because the classic e literature on equilibrium refinements, refining Nash equilibrium, sort of developed without any reference at all to any mechanism by which players might get to an equilibrium in the first place, and certainly no consideration of learning. So that's uh, the, the overview. And let me um, get into the, the model and results now. So the talks, the um, different papers I'm gonna tell you about share a lot of features in common and there'll be some small details that differ from paper to paper, but I'll try and point out as we go. So in all these papers, we'll have agents who are Bayesian and they believe they're facing a fixed steady state distribution of opponent's play but they don't know what that steady state is. And they're gonna play an extensive game repeatedly. And each time it's played, they'll observe the terminal note of the game. They'll tell them all the moves that were made in the game, but it won't tell them what their opponents would have done at information sets that weren't reached. And then players are Bayesian, they get some data, they'll update their beliefs. Now it's not just, there's only one player one, I'm playing one player two, then they'd be playing a repeated game. And that's not what we want. We want players to learn how to play this extensive game and not being involved in a meta or repeated game. So we're gonna have a large population of agents in each player role, as is done in lab experiments. And the players are anonymously and randomly matched to play each other each time period. So because you're never gonna see your current partner again, you have no particular reason to change your play now to change how your partner plays in future matches with the other partners. And I said, our players update their beliefs. Well, of course, there's problems updating beliefs if you see a zero probability event. So we're gonna assume that our players have non-doctrinaire priors. They have a, a prior over the prevailing distribution of opponents play that's represented by a smooth density function. Time in this model is discrete and doubly infinite. And this overlapping generations, 
Each period, some agents leave the population and are replaced. Agents are trying to maximize their expected discounted lifetime payoff against the unknown distribution of opponent's play. So they face dynamic programming problems. And the game is finite, this is a stage game, there's discounting. So there's a solution to these um, dynamic programming problems. Um, and since our agents are expected utility maximizers, it's without loss of generality to let them use deterministic policies. So for any given history, um, you have a deterministic choice of strategy. So what does that mean? So it means you're, you're a new agent, you play in a certain way. You've played once and you've seen your partner play left, it's what you do next time. And your policy says for every sequence of observations you could have had, what do you do in the next match? Okay. So importantly, you know, we could have a population of player ones all using the same policy. That doesn't mean they'll all take the same actions or play the same strategy each period, because if they've met different opponents and observed different outcomes, they will then play different strategies with the same policy. Okay. Is that clear? Can't see anyone, but hopefully you'll speak up if, if there's any questions. Okay. That's good. So the state of a system is the mass of agents with each possible history. There's new players have no history. Some players played once and saw a particular terminal node Z. Some played twice and saw a node Z and a Z prime, and so on. Okay. Importantly, because we have a continuum of agents, the random matching process of matching up the player ones and player twos is deterministic. If half the player ones have a certain history and a third the player twos have a certain history, then one sixth of the matches will combine those player ones and those player twos. If we had 10 player ones and 10 player twos, there'd be some, some randomness in who gets matched with whom. So that's, that's not the case here. So we have a state of a system. How many players have seen each possible sequence of terminal nodes, and the players have policies, what they do as a function of what they've seen. So then that tells us what the prevailing distribution of play in each population is. We look at all the player ones and we say, how many have each history and for each history, how do they play? And that generates an aggregate strategy for player ones. And now we can update our system. We have all these agents, we match them up. They play according to their policies. They update their histories. And since this is an overlapping generations model, some agents leave and are replaced. Okay, so that's, if you haven't seen these, this before, this is a lot of um, abstraction. So I'll take a pause for a question if there are any. Okay, so the, the key, point of, of all this setup is this system has steady states. I mean, steady states are what you think they're the fixed points of the map. And what this system was set up to do was to have steady states. If you're familiar with literature on fictitious play or smooth fictitious play, these are systems that don't have steady states. They converge to steady states asymptotically, but the system is changing and slowing over time. And that works well for analyzing dynamics in static games. But when we want to talk about players' experimentation incentives in these um, extensive games, we need to have a sense of what they see when they experiment. So being able to embed our players in a stationary overall world is very helpful. Okay. So the system has steady states. And they're deterministic steady states. So the system would have been stochastic if the, we had a finite number of agents from random matching, we got rid of that, fine. Still, just on information theoretic considerations, you might be puzzled, how can people be learning and have a steady state? But because if there's more and more information in society, then things don't seem stationary. And the reason is that with our overlapping generations model, 
departing agents take their information with them. So agents are learning each period, but some agents are leaving with their, taking their information. So the total information in society is constant. And that's why steady states exist. And it's now these, I, you know, interest of time, I'm being you know, a little vague on what the overlapping generation structure is. Some of the papers I'll tell you about assumed the agents had fixed finite lifetimes. So people lived capital T periods and got replaced. Other papers assumed agents had a geometric lifetime. So each period, there's a probably gamma that the agent continues to the next period. With the fixed finite lifetimes, the existence of uh, steady states is just a standard finite dimensional fixed point problem. With geometric lifetimes, players can live arbitrarily long. So a state space is infinite dimensional, causes some minor technical problems with the proof that the result is still true. And intuitively, even though we have an infinite dimensional state space, very few agents live a very long time. So the tails of the feasible states are very thin. So in a sense, this infinite dimensional state space is similar to one that is finite dimension. That's this technical background. So if, good. These are our steady states. What do they look like? So if the agents have very short lifetimes, if agents play only once, the steady state is completely determined by their prior. Agents come in, play a best response to the prior and leave. That's not very interesting. In the limit as agents live longer and longer, any steady state must be a self-confirming equilibrium. But that's not the focus of this talk today. The focus today is on what we call patiently stable strategy profiles. These are limits of stable profiles where agents are long lived so they can get enough data for their data to swamp their priors. And they're also patient because myopic agents won't experiment. So the theorem is that every patiently stable profile is a Nash equilibrium. And here's a very high level proof sketch. Long lived agents learn the path of play and they eventually stop experimenting. The option value from experimenting goes away, which is why the stable steady states must be self-confirming equilibria. If a steady state isn't actually a Nash equilibrium, some player has a profitable deviation. They could do better by changing their play. And we use the assumption that agents have non-doctrinaire priors to show that when agents in the role, this is the players who can gain by deviating are patient, they will perceive a non-zero option value to experimenting, which contradicts the fact they should stop. Basically, your prior said there's some chance your opponents were playing this other strategy that would make deviating good. Um, if you get no evidence opposing that and you're really patient, then you should try it and see. And if they really are playing that way, you won't get evidence that opposes it. Okay. So that's from a paper with Dave Levine back in the 90s. I want to move forward in time. A Nash equilibrium is not sufficient for patient stability. Okay. So we want to derive refinements of Nash equilibrium from principles of optimal experimentation. Okay, I'm gonna skip this slide because I'm not feeling the time is going so well. So skip forward 15 years, um, 2006. Let's talk about simple games. These are games of perfect information where no player moves more than once on any path. And we show that for some non-doctrinaire priors, there is no off path experimentation. So the players on the path of play do experiment, the players off the path of play don't. So we don't get backward induction. But off path play isn't completely arbitrary. Nodes one step off the play are reached infinitely often. So people there know what happens if they conform to the strategy. So play one step off the path should be an SCE, self-confirming equilibrium. So definition, a node is one step off the path of strategy profile pi if the node X isn't reached under pi, but it's an immediate successor of a node that is reached. So 
one player can deviate once and make this node be reached. And a profile pi is a subgame confirmed Nash equilibrium. If it's a Nash equilibrium, and if in each subgame beginning one step off the path, the restriction of pi to the subgame is self confirming in that subgame. And the theorem of this paper was that in generic, and I'll skip the formal definition, simple games, any pure strategy subgame confirmed equilibrium is path equivalent to a patiently stable state. And what's the idea? Well, the option value at a node, the, the amount you perceive you could gain by not playing myopically is bounded by a term that's proportional to a subjective probability the node is reached. So if you have very little information, what happens if you deviate, but you know you only play every million years and you finally get a chance to play, you don't have, even though you would learn a lot if you experimented with a new action, if you can't use that information for a million years, it's not worth it, okay? So if you think you're unlikely to be reached, you're not gonna experiment. And players are unlikely to mistakenly think they're likely to be reached when they're not. So they can be, so it's patiently stable limit. It's a sequence of steady states where players get more and more patient and live longer and longer. And there's all along this path, along the sequence, agents might not be experimenting at all. So we don't get backwards induction. As in this simple example, three player centipede game, it's easy to solve by backwards induction. Three should pass getting two. So one should pass to get two instead of one. So player one should also pass. So the unique backwards induction or subgame perfect equilibrium, everyone passes. But the profile where one drops and two drops and three passes is a subgame confirmed equilibrium. Why? Well, given that two drops, it's optimal for one to drop. So it's a Nash equilibrium. So one's playing optimally. Player two is dropping, they should be passing. So what player two is doing is not optimal and we don't have a Nash equilibrium starting with player two, but dropping by player two is self-confirming because player two can drop thinking that player three drops. And if player two never experiments and gives three to move this is what you really does, player two won't learn that three is making this mistake. Okay. So the paper um, has a very cute title about the code of Hammurabi, and it argues that this sort of incomplete off-path learning can explain the persistence of some superstitions like those embodied in one of Hammurabi's codes. And I'll just I'll remark on the side that the theory model says these superstitions or subgame confirmed equilibria can persist forever. You know, it's obviously an idealization. The way I'd like you to think about these results is that superstitions or wrong beliefs that are subgame confirmed can persist a lot longer than those that aren't. So if someone on the path of play has a wrong belief, then they can experiment and find out that it's wrong, and that seems comparatively fragile. So you know, a norm, um, you better do what you're told or you'll be struck dead by lightning, um, isn't a very robust norm because a few kids decide to try and disobey and see what happens, they aren't struck dead by lightning, thing unravels. But if a norm is um, don't accuse um, the wrong people of the murders you saw done, you never see, you hardly ever see any murders done. So that's gonna be a superstition that's um, much harder to, um, to unravel. Let's cut. Fine, so that's 2000s. Now I'm gonna get up to the previous decade, uh, the 2010s. So in signaling games, experimentation incentives for the agents at least partially validate traditional refinements. Consider a learning model where this, uh, the heavy sender agents have types. The types don't change over time. So the certain fraction of high type agents, certain high type senders, certain fraction of low type senders, aggregate mass constant equal to the prior. And suppose that the sender's subjective beliefs about the replies to different signals is a product measure. So you can send different signals 
the only way to learn about the response to a given signal is to play it. You don't learn about the response to one signal by taking a different signal. Now, types that are more likely to gain by deviating to an off-pass signal are more likely to experiment with it. And receivers will learn this, and that's going to constrain their replies. And this is something that Kevin Ho and I captured with the notion of type compatibility. The paper defines a, an order of which types are more compatible with each signal. It's based on the payoffs in the stage game. And the thing that I thought might be of interest to, to computer scientists who like bandits problems is that we extend this ordering on types from the static game to the learning model by using the optimal stopping time of the Gittins index. Okay, so remember the Gittins index is defined with respect to a stopping time that maximizes your average discounted uh, return until stopping. You can take that stopping rule of the Gittins theorem and take the sender's belief over how people respond to a signal and any stopping time for using that signal induces a distribution over what we call discounted receiver actions that you'll observe before stopping. It's like a discounted occupation measure of what the receiver does. And we showed that for each sender type, the expression that defines the Gittins index for a signal is the same as the payoff against the strategy induced by the stopping time. Um, okay, that's, yeah, it's, it's vague, but it gives you a flavor of what we did. So if these two types have the same beliefs and type theta prime is more compatible with the signal than type theta double prime and type, and signal S prime is the highest Gittins index for type theta double prime, it also has the highest index for type theta prime. So if theta prime uses a given signal at a given history, so does theta prime. But since the types have different payoff functions, they don't use the same policy. We don't know if they see the same histories, but then we use a coupling argument like that for the proof of the Gittins theorem to show that in aggregate, the more compatible types play a given signal more than less ones do and that receivers learn this. And that gives us an equilibrium refinement that um, resembles the cho Krebs intuitive criterion, but is stronger. So that paper did not you know, um, suppose that players know their opponent's payoff functions. In particular, the players had non-doctrinaire priors over opponent's play. That means you have to assign positive probability to everything your opponent could do, including playing dominated actions. So the uh, second paper with Kevin adds the restriction that players assign probably zero to opponent strategies that are strictly dominated. And that might seem very natural to you, but I'll point out um, it's actually really only works in special classes of games that here in signaling games, the receivers have no reason to experiment. They're the last mover, they see what the sender does, and they you know, learn nothing different by changing their action. So the receivers won't play strictly dominated strategies and senders with independent beliefs won't play dominated strategies either. But I'll show you an example soon of a different game where senders will choose to play dominated strategies. So if senders can choose to play dominated strategies in the learning model and you build into people's priors, probably zero that people play dominated strategies, now you have a problem because your players will see zero probability events. Not a problem in signaling games. We can end up with a more restrictive refinement called rationally compatible equilibrium. Um, and one more of, of these uh, recent papers um, with uh, Dan Clark studies uh, a signaling game or in addition to sending signals, the senders can send cheap talk messages. So those of you who are familiar with the Cho Krebs paper know there's an informal discussion of senders making speeches to the receivers, but those speeches aren't modeled in the game. So here we're, we're 
making cheap talk and explicit move in the extensive form game. And we're also going to assume, unlike in the other papers in this literature, that there's an asymmetry in lifetimes, that the senders play the game much more often than receivers do, which means that most receivers only interact with very old senders who've already stopped experimenting. So that's you know, a restrictive assumption, but it fits some settings. We argue it fits the settings where the senders are firms or institutions who interact with a large number of individual receivers. And here we're able to drop the assumption of independent beliefs. So Kevin and I needed the senders' beliefs about different signals to be independent in order to appeal to the Gittins index theorem. Here we're not going to use Gittins. We don't need independent beliefs, but we're going to have this assumption of what we call initial trust that, if, that the receivers, there's at least some things that senders can say that receivers believe the first time they hear it. If they hear it, if they've heard it and it's been alive, they stop believing it. They're not infinitely credulous, but they're initially trusting. If, if the sender, some sender makes a cheap talk message. And here we get yet another ref of refinement called justified communication equilibrium. Yeah. Um, I took out this slide. But what I should tell you is that um, both this justified communication equilibrium and the uh, rational, rational compatible equilibrium um, look like classical refinements. They are, they, um, rule out more sequential equilibria than the intuitive criterion does, but less than Kohlberg and Merten say. Okay. So let me just take stock of where we were up through the, uh, the end of last year in this literature. So the, in the simple games I told you about, sequential equilibrium predicts the backward induction solution. So in a generic game, it's a point. So we couldn't have hoped that learning would make tighter predictions in these simple games. And in fact, it may makes much weaker ones. Every subgame confirmed equilibrium is patiently stable. The other hand, signaling games have a great many sequential equilibria, typically, because of the freedom to specify what the receiver believes when they see a signal that's off the equilibrium path. And patient learning can rule out some sequential equilibria. So in one class of games, patient learning is weaker than sequential equilibrium, and the other class of games, it's stronger. So why the differences? Well, signaling games are different than simple games in two ways. First of all, the relative probability of experiments matter. In the simple games, all that mattered is, is this node reached or not? Because every information set was a singleton. So the relative probability of experiments didn't matter. In the signaling game, there can be multiple types of sender who could all send the same signals. So if the receiver receives the signal, it wasn't supposed to happen in equilibrium, they need to have some belief about the relative probability of different sender types. And the relative probabilities of the sender, uh, of, the, of the experimentation by the sender is what, is what pinned it down, okay? Something that I didn't say, um, and a nice thing I think of, of this learning approach is the classic, you know, it can show creps, the off-path off signal should never be sent. So we're talking about how to update after zero probability events and counterfactuals. In the learning model, young senders experiment. So all these off-path signals are sent with some small probability that decreases as lifetimes get long and, and players get patient. Um, so, but because they happen, we don't have to result to metaphysics to decide on their interpretation, we just use Bayes' rule. So, so I think that's nice. Okay, so that's, a, that's why the experimentation probability matters in signaling games. Um, the other hand, signaling games have this nice property, receivers don't need to experiment because they see senders type regardless of what they do. And just to note how to unify these things, if we look at a simple game of length two, the subgame confirmed is backwards induction. And if we look at a signaling game, with a single sender type, then it is a simple game of length two. So we get the same results from sequential equilibrium and patient stability 
in either simple games of links two or degenerate signaling games. Okay, so finally, um, last 20 minutes, let me talk about the uh, newest work I've been doing on this topic. And this is with Dan Clark and Kevin Huss, with the two co-authors of the earlier papers. And we're looking at how the learning program relates to the classic literature on refinements. One thing that shows up a lot in this literature is the idea of normal form invariance, meaning when should two extensive forms have the same solution? What transformations of extensive form should leave our predictions unchanged? So Kohlberg and Mertens argue for that a good solution concept should depend only on the reduced normal form. So that you have any two extensive forms with the same reduced normal form, you should make the same predictions. And the reason they say this, because they argue this reduced normal form captures all the relevant information for decision purposes. Well, Dan and Kevin, I think that's leaving something out. We think it, I would say it captures the relevant information holding fixed your beliefs about the play of your opponents. And that we only should expect the set of learning outcomes to be invariant to transformations that are decision invariant in the sense of clobbering retens, meaning they lead to the same best responses as a function of opponent strategies, but also to have this invariance, we want the transformation to be information invariant. We should give the same feedback to the agents. If we give agents different feedback, they'll learn different things. So, good. What kind of invariances are there? Well, one invariance that Colbert and Rutens argue for, that the reduced normal form picks up and that learning agrees with, is that that it shouldn't matter if you split a decision node. So here I have two different representations of the same game where player one can go out in one or in two and in one and in two, give the move to player two. So in the left-hand game, player one is a single three-part choice, out in one or in two. In the right-hand game, player one first decides out or in, and then if player one goes in, player two sees that, and player one goes either one or two, which player two does not see. Okay. Now, let's look at the sequential equilibrium of these games. So I claim in the left-hand game, the outcome where player one goes out and player two goes right is a sequential equilibrium. Okay, so out is the best response to right because four is more than two. And why is player two playing right? Well, because player two's beliefs at this off path information set is that they think they're probably at the, one probably played in one. How do you make that work with sequential equilibrium? Well, we have to specify this consistent belief. So we have to have some trembles for player one where player one mostly plays out and you know, plays in one with probably say epsilon and plays in two with probably epsilon squared. And now compute two's posterior and two thinks one probably went in one and two plays right. So it's a sequential equilibrium in the game on the left. Is that clear? On the other hand, it's not in the game on the right. Okay, well, the move starting with one playing one or two, that subgame, that's a simultaneous move subgame between one and two. And in that subgame, action two for player one strictly dominates action one. So player one can't play one in the right-hand game. So two has to play left. So the only sequential equilibrium in the right-hand game is in and then um, two, and then player two plays left. So sequ sequential equilibrium is not invariant to splitting um, decision nodes, but the set of patiently stable outcomes is because player two gets the same information 
player one gets the same information about player two in both cases. Um, good. Okay. And in fact, so this out is patiently stable in both of these games, both the left hand game and the right hand game. Didn't matter how we wrote it. Another example of a difference um, the transformations make. So we can take any perfect information game, like that three player centipede game, and look at the associated normal form. And suppose that people display the normal form. Okay, so we have this, this game where each player has two choices, drop or pass. They're playing the normal form. They play simultaneously. The moves are revealed. Okay, so the players see each other's actions. Non-doctrinaire priors imply the player threes will never pass. because It's weakly dominated. And unlike in the extensive form, if each player writes down their move on a piece of paper, and then they all turn up, hold up pieces of paper, then the terminal, the terminal note of a simultaneous move game encodes all three player strategies to players' actions. So player twos don't need to experiment to learn player threes play. So because the player threes aren't playing pass, twos will see it. And even, even if they initially thought that th threes dropped, they see them passing, they'll eventually learn that threes pass. So twos will start to pass. And then <coughs> with enough more data, the player ones will start to pass. So more generally, if agents play the normal form corresponding to a simple game, then the patiently stable outcomes do satisfy backwards induction. So that's a very simple way of seeing <coughs> that we don't have normal form invariance. Because a normal form doesn't have enough information to pin down the result of learning. It has the decision relevant information, but if we want invariance of learning outcomes, we need to replicate the feedback players get. So the way we propose doing that is what we call a terminal node partition. So the terminal node partition is that if player one drops, players don't get to observe the choices of players two and three. And if player one passes and player two drops, then players don't get to observe the choice of player three. So here's a picture of a simultaneous move game with terminal node partitions added. So the usual, the dashed lines between um, the information to the player two means player two can't tell if one dropped or passed when player two moves. And the dashed line between the if sets of player three, player three can't tell anything when they move. So it's a one shot simultaneous move game, just as I said. The new feature of this game is the little smaller dots connecting some of the terminal nodes on the bottom of the graph. And that's the terminal node partition. So what you see the left hand of the figure, there's the four terminal nodes all linked together. If player one drops, all anyone else sees is that player one dropped. They don't get to see what player two chose or player three chose. And on the right hand side, if player one passes in two drops, then people don't get to see what player three would have done if two had passed. So, so this is a way of preserving the information that's lost when we move to the normal form. So this idea of terminal node partitions isn't new. It's been used in past work to define equilibrium concepts that were inspired by learning. And what we're doing differently in our paper is we're explicitly incorporating these terminal node partitions into the learning models to see what happens. Okay, one last difference between uh, the predictions of our patient learning models and classic refinements is how it handles forward induction. So Kohlberg, Mertens, and subsequent papers argue that solution concepts should imply the iterated deletion of weakly dominated strategies or the related concept of forward induction. And I put forward induction in quotes because people have a sense of what it means 
but there's not one accepted definition. There's many similar definitions in the literature. Um, Governor Wilson, Colbert Mertens, uh, Rennie, and so on. Um, none of these definitions has been accompanied by a theory of how players could come to have equilibrium beliefs or why they should maintain their beliefs in equilibrium after a deviation. Because one way of thinking of forward induction, you solve these mistakes and you want to explain it in a way consistent with everyone playing equilibrium from now on and people trying to be rational, even though what you've seen so far didn't look like that. Okay. So here's a simple example of, the, of a difference between learning models and classical refinements. It's a failure of forward induction. So they want to go out and get zero or in one or in two. So the extensive form on the left and the normal form on the right. Looking at the normal form on the right, it's very clear that out for player one dominates in one. You get a sure zero versus a sure negative one. So what Colbert Mertens's version of forward induction would like us to do is say whatever we predict in this game should be the same prediction as if we just crossed out in one for player one because it's, it's dominated. They say a stable set should contain a stable set after removing a dominated strategy. Once we get rid of the row in one, okay, then in two and left is the only sequential equilibrium. Because if player one goes in two, like, given that player one can't go in one, if player one goes in, player two knows it's, it's in two. So player two plays left. So player one wants to go in. So fine. That's the answer from Colbert Mertens. What's the story from the learning model? Well, suppose you're a player one and you're gonna play this game repeatedly and you don't know what player two is doing. And this, you think probably player two is playing um, right or playing right with high probability, 0.9 or something, but maybe there's some chance that player two um, typically plays left. If player two is playing left more than half the time, in two is actually better for you. But, but your prior is, is such that you're better off playing out. So you're, if, if you're myopic, you play out, but suppose you're patient, then you might perceive an information value of giving player two the move to see what, what would happen. Okay. But if you think player two is probably playing right, then playing in two will give you a payoff of near negative five, maybe minus four in expectation, whereas playing in one only costs you minus one. So what you might want to do is play in one a couple of times and see what happens. And then if player two indeed plays right as you expected, you stick without. But if player two turns out to be playing left, you'll switch to in two. Now, so it's a point here in this example, in one and in two, you have the same information about player two's action. And in one gives higher static payoff if you think, two is likely to play right. So we can we can and have written down priors under which the player one agents, um, when they're newborn and perceive a life experimentation, initially play in one a bit. And then they learn that the twos are playing um, right and they stop. So in this overlapping generations model, you know, there'll be a few young player ones experimenting within one mostly old player ones playing out. The player twos will be playing right because they will have seen that normally ones go out, but on the rare occasions that the player ones go in, they're playing in one. So 
it's optimal then for the tooth to play right. So that can give you, a, hopefully that gives you a sense of why there's no reason to expect um, rational learning models to give us anything like forward induction in general games. Okay. Gavadan and Wilson um, are um, when they're tr trying to explain why forward induction is a desirable property of a refinement, where well, we'd like our concepts to have forward induction, to say if an outcome does not satisfy forward induction, there's an equivalent game in which this outcome results only from Nash equilibria and not from any sequential equilibrium. And because they um, support this idea of normal form invariance, they view this as a problem, that why should we take something where it's not a sequential equilibrium as some equivalent game? Of course, from our viewpoint, the problem is, why are these equivalent normal forms supposed to be played the same way? This comes back to the fact there's no reason to expect normal form invariance. And the, the logic, or just one of the arguments in favor of forward induction is this normal form invariance. And forward induction on its own isn't compatible, isn't applied by learning models, and normal form invariance isn't applied by learning models. So it's just a very different way of thinking about equilibrium. So that's what um, we've done so far. Let me just mention a few what I think are interesting open questions. So I expect agents to learn the consequences of actions and information sets closer to the path of play. They take fewer people to deviate more quickly than information sets farther away. So subgame confirmed equilibrium is a very stark version of that. It's that people learn the path of play, people on the path of play learn one step off, and then nothing at all gets learned two or more steps off. And that just seems too stark. So it, it'd be interesting to see if there's some way of formalizing the idea that players have more information two steps off the path than three, and more three than four, and so on. Another uh, open question. So my paper with Dan Clark, um, to get a refinement for signaling games with cheap talk, we assumed an asymmetry in interaction rates, that the senders played the game a lot more than the receivers did. And we had a story for why that made sense in the signaling games we were studying, but are there other settings where asymmetries in the um, interaction rates of different populations have interesting, consequen interesting consequences? Okay. The work I've told you so far all has agents whose priors at least include the truth as something they thought was possible. I mean, we, players can get stuck in, in steady states where they have incorrect beliefs that off path play, but it's not because we gave them a prior that forbid them to learn what happened off path. They just didn't happen to get enough data. Um, if players have uh, incorrect beliefs about the extensive form, then they're misspecified and they'll actually be unable to learn what's really going on. So that's, um, opens up an intersection between this learning games literature, which has been assuming correctly specified Bayesians, and a pretty large recent body of work in economics on Bayesian agents with misspecified priors. So what would happen if we let people be misspecified about the game and try to go through some parts of a learning and games program? We don't know. And then a um, natural question for computer science audience. You know, so we used expected discounted utility as our way of deriving experimentation rates. We weren't happy with just arbitrary assumptions. Um, and you know, being economists, this seemed like the, the natural um, starting point for analysis. But it'd be interesting to extend this program to agents who use other rules regarding their policies, things like upper confidence bounds, which are computationally simpler, 
you know, they have a bit of the flavor of the expected a bit of a flavor of a dynamic programming solution are quite the same. So the question is, to what extent do we conclusions carry over to these heuristics and what kind of new things come up? And so I um, actually managed to finish early because I was radically trimmed off a notation out of my slides. So I hope that wasn't too high level, but I'm happy to take questions now and thank you very much. All right, thanks a lot. Um, let's see, do we have any questions in the audience here? Um, okay, I can ask one question. I guess yeah. I was, uh, your, your third bullet was kind of getting at this, but um, yeah, I guess like maybe you could just say a little more about what what is known kind of when you have priors that are not necessarily like fully supported. Okay, in the um, learning in games, setting very little and that only for myopic agents when there is um, some work on how you can get um, you can explain things like Jahil's analogy based uh, equilibrium with certain kinds of, of wrong models of the world um, one reason there's little known I, I should say is that the, the combination of misspecified beliefs and non-myopia makes things very complicated and unexpected. Um, so that hasn't been studied in a game setting, but even in decision settings, it's known you can have a decision problem where correctly specified agents, their beliefs converge whether or not they're patient and where myopic agents' beliefs converge, even if they're misspecified. But patient and non, and misspecified agents' beliefs needn't even converge. Um, okay, so let me um, review this a bit. So if, if you have exogenous data, and people are just learning from exogenous data, then it's known from Burke that beliefs converge to the distributions in the prior that minimize the KL divergence with the truth. So if your prior allowed the truth, that's the minimizer. And if not, you pick wh whatever pointer points in the prior comes closest. In extensive games or in many decision problems, the data you see depends on your action. So Burke's result doesn't really apply directly. And it can, if you have a patient misspecified agent, they might play something for a while, decide action A is optimal, and after playing action A, decide, no, I should go experiment with action B, and then play action B and go back and experiment with action A. So that's even just the, the question of when beliefs will converge in this setting seems complicated. So you might have to start by analyzing this just for myopic agents. I'd be happy to do that. Even that has not been done very systematically. I mean, imagine that you think you're playing a simultaneous move game with your opponent, but really your opponent gets to see your move. So then, um, cool. Thanks. Yeah, that's super interesting. Um, I think we're, we're a little over time now, so we should probably go to a break before the next talk, but why don't we uh, thank Drew again? All right, thanks all. Pick your art. Yeah, we're really glad you could join us. Um, and yeah, so we'll be back at 11.30 for uh, Amy Greenwald's talk. Okay. I'll, I'll, right. I'll, be, I'll be back here too then. See you <laughs> that then. sounds good. Right.